Okay, this is um, uh, Unit 3, Federalist Era, Part 3. We're going to move on now to um, the, the origins of the Bill of Rights and then on from there to the beginning of the first two-party system. The uh, first ten amendments to the Constitution are known as the Bill of Rights. Where did they come from? What was the deal? At the Constitutional Convention, James Madison, arguably the most influential member, um, argued against having a federal Bill of Rights. It's not so much that he was actively opposed to it, he just didn't see a need for it. Uh, the way he looked at it was most of the laws are going to be state laws, and the states have their own Bills of Rights. Wouldn't that do the trick? <clears throat> but as it turned out, he uh, changed his mind on that when in order to get it approved by nine states, there are uh, some states, at least one, maybe as many as three, uh, where it would not pass the convention, it would not get approved unless a promise was made to add a Bill of Rights, or specifically that a state could, a state ratifying convention could approve it with conditions, all right? The approval would, that the condition, the approval could be revoked if the convention were not met, okay? That's like at least three states. This is not directly related to the Bill of Rights, I'm told at least three states ratified on condition that they retain the right to withdraw from the Union later if they decided to. Okay, so um, the, the amendment, the Constitution was ratified as of uh, 1788. The new government began to function in 1789 and the first Congress acted to provide a Bill of Rights. Okay. It formally proposed 12 amendments. An amendment is a change. The procedure is drawn up in Article 5 of the Constitution. Now, to review the procedure, either in, in case your uh, high school government teacher was uh, asleep at the switch or <laughs> you were asleep in your desk, <laughs> uh, there are two methods for proposal, two methods for ratification or formal approval. The proposal takes place at the national level ratification or approval takes place at the state level, takes both. There are two methods the Constitution provides for proposal. Only one of them has ever been used. The all, the all 33 amendments that have been proposed thus far were proposed by Congress. It takes a two-thirds vote of both houses of Congress to formally propose an amendment. Okay? The other method would be uh, if uh, it turns out if two-thirds of the states should petition Congress to summon a national convention where each state would appoint a delegation and uh, they would vote equally as states. Uh, two-thirds vote of the delegates to a national convention could propose an amendment. That's never been done, although there have been persistent attempts to summon such a convention for many years now, and it's not unusual they'll get within a handful of states of having enough of with like within two states just a few years back. Now, I used to oppose that for fear that the wrong people would control it and it would just run off and do no telling what. Um, that seems somewhat less likely now. There are some changes that we seriously need to make at the constitutional amendment level. This is my opinion and that of many others that elected officials will just never do. So the people need to exercise that, okay? Uh, once an amendment has been formally proposed, it is sent to the states and it takes, uh, to be ratified, it takes the approval of three-fourths of the states. There are two ways the approval can be granted. Congress decides which will be used and um, only one of them has only been used one time. The prevalent method is that it's done by the legislatures of the states. An amendment is ratified when it's formally approved by the legislatures of three-fourths of the states. At present, that's 38, I believe. Um, the other method used only for the 21st Amendment, which ended prohibition <laughs> uh, in 1933, it was sent to special conventions of the states, like the original Constitution was. Each state would summon a convention vote the thing up or down. Okay, so uh, back to where we were. In 1791, Congress proposed 
12 Amendments principal author, uh, James Madison. He may have been the sole author. I don't actually know for sure. Now, the states ratified 10 of these and rejected the other two. And those 10 become known as the Bill of Rights. And uh, they're, they're worth a read. You know, the First Amendment has some of the most basic rights. And and the, the way it's worded, you're James Madison sitting there ready to start writing on a blank piece of paper. How do you guarantee this right or the other? It's important to understand. Since uh, the prevailing mode of thought among political theorists at that time was that the government itself is a standing threat to liberty because the more powerful it gets, the less freedom we have. So the way you protect a freedom is to tie government's hands in that area. So the First Amendment, the first right supposedly guaranteed in the First Amendment is freedom of religion. What words did Madison use? How about this? Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or forbidding, I forget the word, the free exercise thereof. And he goes on to include freedom of the press, uh, freedom of speech, the press, and peaceable assembly. Okay? If you're out there looting and pillaging and burning buildings down, that is not a constitutionally protected peaceful assembly. There have been reporters, given the events of <coughs> last summer, uh, and maybe ongoing, who knows? Who, uh, they're, I mean, their buildings burning in the background. They say, well, they're, the demonstrators are mostly peaceful. To me, that would be like a sports writer covering a football game and only describing the spectators. Oh, well, leaving that aside. Now, two of the amendments were rejected. What were they? Curious at all? Here goes. One of them that was rejected would have given the original, I think this was going to be the first one, and it's just the first states um, that were involved in this. They were approved, by the way, in 1791. By that time, we've got the full roster of the first 13 states. It would have given the original states a permanently superior political position relative to any other states that might be admitted subsequently. So we would have a two-tiered structure of the original states and the later added states first class, second class citizenship. They, even they themselves, shot that down. That's a bad idea. The other one has a bit more of a tangled history. The other rejected amendment provided that if Congress should vote itself a pay raise, and by the way, they're the only ones who can do that, so keep your shirt on, um, the members do not actually get the additional pay until after the next congressional election. So you're a member of the House or the Senate, and you helped vote into law a congressional pay raise. You're going to have to face the voters with that before you actually get the added money. That one was rejected, too. But these early um, proposed amendments, in fact, on until the end of the 20th century, I think, it had no expiration date. The more recent amendments, the last uh, paragraph of the amendments is this this uh, amendment shall be inoperative unless ratified by the requisite number of states within seven years. If it hadn't got there in seven years, it's off the table. Well, as the 19th century and a good bit of the 20th century rolled by, every now and then some state legislature would be having a slow day and just for grins, they would <laughs> ratify that amendment. So it's gradually accumulating states. It's a moving target because the number of states keeps getting bigger. So the number of states it would take to ratify keeps getting bigger too. Okay. Um, in the late 19, mid 1980s, the United States, the, the Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives, uh, Weatherford College graduate Jim Wright of Fort Worth, <laughs> cooked up a plan where Congress could vote itself a 50% pay hike without anybody having to vote on it directly. Hmm. They created an outside uh, agency which would recommend congressional pay raises. The pay raises would take effect automatically unless blocked by both houses by noon on a certain day. The Senate immediately, indignantly, and unanimously blocked it. 
Still takes the house. Well, they waited till the last day to take it up, and they got till straight up high noon <laughs> to do that, and they got all tangled up in parliamentary procedure. Doggone it, boys. We just we just went over time here. We're going to have to take that pay raise. Well, that stirred up some dissent. There was a, a disc jockey, like a guy playing records on the radio out in like Seattle or somewhere, who was politically aware. He took exception to that and started telling his listeners, this is a little before the advent of talk radio, hmm. that if they if they wanted to protest that, he recommended they get a tea bag, Boston Tea Party tax protest, stick it in an envelope, address it to your congressman, and just shove it in the mail. Within a week or two, if there had been an internet at the time, which there was not, it would have gone viral, there were convoys of 18 wheelers, their trailers bulging with envelopes, containing tea bags converging on Washington, D.C. from all directions. And Congress hastily backtracked, resented the pay hike, and uh, Speaker of the House Jim Wright, for that and other reasons, had to resign both from the Speakership and from Congress in disgrace. Well, along about that time in that environment, somebody remembered that old proposed amendment. More states signed on, and in 1992, 203 years after it was proposed, that amendment was formally approved and is the 27th Amendment. Okay, why did we do all that? I don't know. Okay, just a little stuff that maybe I shouldn't just tell you everything I find interesting. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, political parties. The people who wrote the Constitution had no idea there were going to be political parties. So they set up a system particularly a system of choosing the president and vice president that's supposed to work in the absence of political parties. Um, nonetheless, in a free open system like ours, not everybody's gonna agree on what kind of country we should become, what laws should be passed, what policies adopted. So it's just natural that that's gonna happen. Now I should tell you, first question on your worksheet there, uh, how did Americans of that era, meaning the late 18th century, how did they view political parties? Very negatively. It, they seemed to be, they would be uh, closed, self-interested factions who were uh, going to attempt to get their way and probably make themselves rich uh, against the, the wishes of the majority. Plus, the only country that had political parties, and the first one to have them, was Great Britain going back to the 1680s. And we've just gone through a really messy divorce with that country. And and their system was, to our, our uh, when we looked at things, it was mind-bogglingly corrupt. It's just their normal way of doing business. So uh, even the men who set up the first political parties didn't call them that. Some of them would have uh, challenged you to a duel if you'd accused them of setting up a political party. So how in the world did they come about? Um, the first Congress, uh, some historians will classify them as pro-administration versus any administration, but they don't have names. They're not really organized against each other. So and they're working to solve some basic problems that really would be partisan problems anyway. So it's sort of a one big, almost happy family environment. They're you know working together on all this with some disagreements. Now, that's gonna last until somebody stands up and proposes a really controversial idea or law that will tend to divide the members or polarize them against each other. So let's say that one gets decided and then another one comes along and the same guys divide the same way again and then another one after that and pretty soon they're going to become to begin entertaining suspicions about whether those other guys over there are really with the program or not. Each, you're dividing into two different groups based on different ideas about which direction the company should, country should pursue and what kind of country we should be. So these suspicions turn into doubts. And so eventually they will begin, they'll begin to organize just in self-defense. Oh, we're not a political party. We're just concerned citizens organizing to keep these, these other, these criminals over here from hijacking the nation perverting it away from its true principles. And out of this, political parties will emerge, as we shall see in part four. <laughs>